Today on America's Test Kitchen, Becky shows Julia how to make classic strawberry jam. Lisa reviews the best tools for canning. And Dan shows Bridget the secrets to making the best homemade bread and butter pickles. It's all coming up right here on America's Test Kitchen. Canning is a lost art. Before fresh produce was available year-round, canning is how we stayed alive during those long, cold winter months. <laughs> Old canning recipes make huge batches, like 20 to 30 jars. And that means that you have to set aside a day or two and make a huge mess in your kitchen. But we've been hard at work here in the test kitchen, developing small batch recipes that are easier and more fun to make. There's less prep, less mess, and you can play around with different flavors. When you think of jam recipes, you probably think of this book. And although this strawberry jam recipe has been used by home cooks for many years, we know we can do better. That's right. That recipe was too sweet. It was too thick. It didn't have enough fresh berry flavor. So we made over 200 jars of jam. 200 jars of jam. 200. That's a lot of jam. It is a lot of jam. But we wanted to put that fresh fruity flavor front and center. So it all starts with berries. And I have three pounds of strawberries here, cut into half inch pieces, put them into our Dutch oven. And I can see how full this Dutch oven is. So using a big pot must be pretty important here. Yeah, you want a nice, big, heavy pot. And now I'm going to take a potato masher, and I'm going to start crushing these berries. Oh, before you start cooking. Yes. And this will shorten the cooking time, which will preserve a lot of that fresh, fruity flavor. So it just kind of jump starts things. I want them to be pretty broken down, but not completely. I still want to have some chunks in the jam. This doesn't look like an overwhelming amount of jam. No, this is a small batch. It's not a project that's going to take all afternoon or all day. And it's actually pretty easy to do. OK, so that looks pretty good. Now I'm going to add three cups of sugar. And I'm adding one Granny Smith apple that I peeled and grated. Oh. Now the apple contains a lot of natural pectin. That'll thicken up the jam without giving it that really overly gelled texture. And it also adds a nice little bit of fruitiness. And then finally, I'm adding two tablespoons of bottled lemon juice. It sounds weird that we're adding bottled lemon juice to fresh berries for making jam, but there's a good reason, and that reason is safety. When you buy fresh lemons, the acidity in the juice can vary dramatically. Yet when you buy bottled lemon juice, the acidity is always the same, and that's important so that your jam has the right pH for canning. So I'm going to turn this on. I want medium-high heat. And we're going to bring this to a boil, let all the sugar dissolve. And we're going to cook this for 20 to 25 minutes. We want it to get nice and thick, and we want it to reach a temperature between 217 to 220 degrees. Right, and it's at that temperature that the pectin will do its work, and the jam will start to thicken up. You got it. All right, you can see how it's getting really frothy here. Yeah. So I'm just going to stir it to prevent it from boiling over. What you don't want to do is turn down the heat and bring it to a lazy boil. That'll just extend the cooking time. You'll cook off a lot of that fresh, fruity flavor, and it'll be harder for it to gel up. All right, so let it do its foaming thing, but just stand here and stir it constantly. That's right. And this foaming will subside a little bit after a few minutes. But whoa. as you can see, whoa, it really gets going. This is like extreme time. jam making right here. <laughs> yep. Don't you're, go check your email. You're <laughs> <laughs> you got this under control. That's right. The jam's been boiling away here for 20 minutes. So we're going to take its temperature. And the first thing to do is to whisk it up to even out any hot spots. I'm going to tilt the pot so I have a nice deep pool. I'm going to wave the thermometer back and forth. And we're looking for 217 to 220. There we go. All right, so I'll turn that off. And now I have a plate in the freezer that I put in earlier, if you grab that for me. And there's lots of different ways to test the consistency of a jam. This is our favorite way. We take a teaspoon of the liquid, put it on the frozen plate. We'll throw that back in the freezer. Okay. And we'll check it in two more minutes. Okay. So it's been about two minutes. Here you are. Thank you. So we essentially super chilled the jam, so we'll know what it looks like when it sets up. I'm just going to drag my finger right through the center here. And you can see how it leaves a trail. Yeah. That's how we know that it's ready to go. We took some pictures in the test kitchen to show you what it looks like when it's not ready to go. There's no trail. It all runs together. If that happens, you need to put the jam back on the stove, let it boil for three more minutes, and then do the plate test again. All right, now I'm going to skim off some of the foam you can see on the top of the jam here. So you want to skim off the foam on top of the jam, not because it'll make the jam go bad, but that foam will actually set up and you'll have foamy jam. OK, so that looks pretty good. Now it's time to start canning. We have some jars that are in hot water here. Yeah, and I can see you're all set up to do this. That's right. I have all my tools. We mm -hmm. have a big pot of boiling water. We have the jars sitting there on a jar rack. OK, and so they're sitting in the hot water. That's to sanitize them? No, actually, because we're going to be processing the jars for more than 10 minutes, the USDA says you don't need to sanitize the jars. But they do need to be hot, because otherwise the hot jam could crack the glass. OK. 
So we'll go ahead and take the hot jars out and we'll just drain off the liquid. I'm just gonna bring them over here to my towel. We'll set them upside down to drain for a minute. Now it's finally time to get that jam in the jars. So I have a funnel here. This will just make the job a lot easier. Mm -hmm. So we just ladle it right in. And I want to leave a quarter inch of headspace, the distance between the top of the food and the top of the jar. If you don't leave enough, there'll be no room for the food to expand as it processes. So we're good to go. Now I'm gonna take a skewer and I'm gonna put this down into the jam. This is to remove any air bubbles. If you leave those air bubbles unchecked, they could rise to the surface and they could prevent the jar from sealing properly. Okay, so I'm just gonna wipe off the edge of the rim here so it's nice and clean so we'll be able to get the lid on properly. And now I'll put on the lid. And now these modern lids don't need to be heated before you put them on the jar. You just use them as they are. That's exactly right. And you'll see I'm not really cranking the lid on really tight. I just want to do what we call fingertip tight. If you tighten the lid too much, oxygen may not be able to escape, and that's a key part of the process. So you just want to get it fingertip tight. Fingertip tight. That's right. Got it. So one down. Let's move on. Let's do another one. It's like a little jamming party. I know. Get rid of those air bubbles. Put on the lid. Fingertip tight. And now we're ready to get these into the boiling water. It's ready to go. So if you want to take that lid off for me, put the first jar in. So we have boiling water here, and I have a jar rack that's holding the jars upright in the water. You want at least one inch of water to cover the top of the jars. Okay, and you can put the lid back on for me. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So we'll bring that back up to a boil, and once it starts boiling, then we'll start the timer. We'll let it go for 10 minutes. Then we'll shut off the heat and just let them sit in the hot water for five more minutes. That just gives the food time to settle down and lets that vacuum action start to happen where the metal lid gets pulled inward. Now that's for sea level, right? That's right. Okay, so if you're at a different altitude, you might have a slightly different boiling time. And you can find those boiling times on our website at americastestkitchen.com. Are you excited to try some jam? I am. Me too. I can't wait. So we even made these cute little labels. with the, <laughs> Those are cute. Yeah, with the date and the name so we know exactly what we have in case we really get going and have a whole bunch of jam. Now before you pop this lid open, I want to show that that lid is still depressed. And that's important because that lets you know that the food inside the jar is still safe. If you see that depressed lid and you have to really pull to get it off, it means you have no bacteria in there that's going to make you sick. All right, let's pop this open. And like you said, it takes a little bit of force. We have some scones. I know, these are gorgeous. Would you like some butter? I would love some butter. You can tell right off the bat, this is not your average jam from the supermarket. It has a nice dark color and it smells like strawberries. It has a really nice consistency too. You can see it's not too thick. Mm. This jam's amazing. It's one step mm. away from eating a fresh mm. strawberry. That is wow. so good. Uh huh. It was so much fun to make. It was fun to make. <laughs> it was so good. Mm -hmm. Becky, awesome job. Thank you. To make the best strawberry jam at home, start with great berries. Then shorten the cooking time by mashing the berries first, then add the sugar and bottled, not fresh lemon juice, and shredded apples for a boost of natural pectin. Bring it all up to a boil, then keep stirring until that mixture is thickened. Then use the frozen plate test to make sure your jam is properly set up. Finally, put it in the jars, add the lids, and process it. And there you have it, our foolproof recipe for classic strawberry jam. Mm, I'm going back for seconds. Me too. We tested two gadgets you need for canning, pots and jar lifters. And you need a really big pot to hold plenty of canning jars. We tested three and they were priced from $24 to $97. They came with jar racks inside. Two of them are stainless steel, this one's enamel coated steel. All of them hold at least 20 quarts and they fit every size jar just fine. We timed how long it took full pots to boil. We used them over and over and we washed them and left them damp to check for rust. All three did the job, but two of them were not so tough. This speckled pot, its coating got nicked and it rusted. This pot was almost $100, but its rack rusted and left red marks inside. Our winner is this one. It's called the Victorio Stainless Steel Multi-Use Canner. We love the clear lid, we love the grippy handles, and it's all around toughness. It has a thermometer in the lid that doesn't always work, but you do not really need that to tell you the water's boiling. It's $75 and it will last a lifetime. Next, you're gonna need a jar lifter to move the jars in and out of the boiling water. We tested these four and they cost about six to $11. We hoisted up heavy, full jars in every size. Now these two are the classic type. They have the straight, 
bars for handles and they have these rubber coated grabbers. But they really hurt your hands and they just didn't grip well. With heavy, full quart jars, they were kind of scary. And coming out of boiling water, you do not want these things to fail. This pair was kind of interesting. It has these little four teensy feet. That was even scarier. Our favorite was this one. It's called the Ball Secure Grip Jar Lifter. It's got these wide, comfy handles, these molded rubber grips, and they really grabbed onto every jar. Plus, you can work them with one hand because they're spring-loaded. They're a couple dollars more than that old school style, but for $10.99, you're ready to start canning. When was the last time you made pickles? Well, if you're like most folks, probably never. Supermarket pickles are convenient, but homemade are so much better, and they don't have to take weeks to make. So Dan is here to show us how to make classic bread and butter pickles that come together in only two days, right? That's right. All we're, right. we're going to be here for two days making these. <laughs> no, but the hands-on stuff is actually, is actually not that bad at all. Okay. We're using two pounds of small Kirby pickling cucumbers, really good crunch to them. The first thing we're gonna look at is how you prep them. And so we looked at a lot of resources, the USDA being a big one, and the USDA recommends to take off this blossom end because there's an enzyme in there that can soften the pickles over time. So you wanna get rid of that. Sometimes they don't have the stem on here, so it's a little tricky to figure out which ah. is which. What we like to do is just take off both sides, just to be sure. And you don't need to take off a lot. 16th of an inch is fine. So then we're just gonna cut these into quarter inch slices. So a nice grip on there. Take your time. It's a good time to practice your knife skills. If they're a little thick or too thin, it's not the end of the world. And we prefer those small Kirby cucumbers for a few reasons. They're small, so they fit into the jars. Larger cucumbers have bigger seeds. Those seeds can start to separate away from the flesh of the cucumber. And eventually, the cucumber itself can fall into pieces as they are being pickled. Finally, fresh is best. Buy the freshest cucumbers that you can find. The fresher they are, the firmer their pectin is. And firmer cucumbers mean crisper pickles. All right, so I just got those last few done there. We can stop there if we want, right? We could just do cucumbers. I don't want to. You don't want to. <laughs> you never want to just stop there. So we really like adding other ingredients that provide flavor, but then also take up the flavor of the brine, and then they're delicious on their own. So we're gonna start with an onion right here, and I'm gonna quarter this and then slice it really thin. Add this to my bowl. Okay, so next up, red bell pepper. Nice flavor, good sweetness, which works with the sweet brine we're gonna do, but also that burst of color in there is nice. So I'm just gonna take the top off and the bottom and slice down the sides. We wanna leave those seeds and ribs behind, and I like taking it off this way as opposed to kind of opening it up and sure. then trying to take it off. So you have all that there. And then we're just gonna do little matchsticks on these guys. All right, so now time to add the salt. So salt is really important, obviously for flavor, but it also is gonna draw a lot of moisture out of these vegetables. We're using something called canning and pickling salt, which is really just pure salt. So if you have a kosher salt that is also just pure salt, that's fine as well. You wanna avoid ones that have anti-caking agents in them or iodine, anything like that. They can make your brine really cloudy instead of clear. So you don't get to see those beautiful cucumbers and all that sure. stuff in there. So this is two tablespoons of canning and pickling salt. And I'm just gonna use my hands, just get in there. Mix it up. So this needs to sit in the fridge for about three hours. We'll get tons of moisture out and then we're gonna drain that away. Okay. So if you wouldn't mind, I'm gonna wash my hands up and you can pop that in that low boy over there. Sounds good. So now we're gonna talk about the jars that we're gonna use for this. So these are canning jars. They're one pint each, so we're gonna do four of them. We also have our nice large pot over here and our rack in the bottom. Now the rack is important. We're gonna put these jars in here. We don't want them to sit right on the bottom. When this comes up to a boil, they'll start to wiggle and they can crack. So I'm gonna fill this up with water and we just wanna cover them. Okay, so now we're gonna move over to the stove. Sure, you don't need me to get that? Well, if I fall, I'm gonna need <laughs> you to pick me up. <laughs> so we're gonna bring this up to a simmer over medium high heat, and then we're gonna turn it off, put the cover on, and leave it just to stay warm. And you'll notice that we're not sterilizing the jars in this recipe. A lot of them do, but you only really need to do it if you're processing for less than 10 minutes. That's USDA guidelines. We're gonna process for longer than that, so we're not worried about it. So the canning water came up to a simmer, turned off the heat and covered it, and we're just gonna let those jars sit and stay nice and warm. So now we're gonna turn our focus to the brine. We're gonna start with three cups of apple cider vinegar, a little more flavor than just regular white distilled. And to that, we're gonna add two cups of granulated white sugar. So it looks like a lot, trust me, there's a lot less than, than you saw in a lot of recipes. <laughs> We found a lot of recipes were syrupy sweet, just way too much sugar. We find that's also the case with a lot of store-bought pickles. We also have a cup of water. If it's straight vinegar, it ends up just being too much. 
Okay, now for our spices. Now you can buy pickling blend. We really like doing it ourselves. So we can pick and choose exactly what we want. So we've got a tablespoon of yellow mustard seeds. This is very classic for bread and butter pickles. We also have three quarters of a teaspoon of turmeric. Now this obviously provides some flavor, but it really is all about that color. That's key. Half teaspoon of celery seeds, which are really savory, ton of flavor in there. We love those for pickles. And finally, a quarter of a teaspoon of ground clove. Huh. Make sure you measure this accurately. Clove can be really, really strong, so you only want a quarter of a teaspoon in there. So I'm gonna bring this up to a boil over medium high heat, and then we're gonna cover it, put it off to the side. Heating it up helps to dissolve all that sugar, really bloom those spices as well. So these have sat for three hours in the fridge. We're gonna drain them in this colander over here. Oh yeah. See that? That would make some watery pickles. So I'm not gonna rinse them off. The salt that we added, we want that to be in there because it's really important for seasoning. So I'm just giving them a good shake, get that water to drip out. I have some paper towels. I'm gonna go in and just make sure I get any surface moisture off. We want it to be really nice and dry. And now it is assembly time. Okay. Which is the most fun part of pickling, I think. So we're gonna come over here and we're gonna grab our jars out. Now, if you have really good pain tolerance, you could do this with your hands, <laughs> or you can use the rack that we have in there, but I really like using these. Okay. And the spring-loaded ones are awesome. They're like spring-loaded you know, gardening shears. Sure. A lot easier in your hands. So they open and close, and they grab right onto the top of the jar really easily. They don't slip off. I've seen people try this with tongs. Yes. And it can be really bad. I've tried them with tongs a few times, yes, and it's can catastrophes, right? Can't, well, I didn't want to say that the person I saw do it with tongs was you, oh. but <laughs> you just cop to it. So you want to do that and just drain it out, bring it over here. We're going to turn them upside down on the towel. All right, these are nice and dry, so we'll flip them over. You know, I mentioned there's a lot of ways to make sure these are really crispy. Mm -hmm. Here's another one. So we're actually using something called pickle crisps, which is from Ball. It's just calcium chloride, essentially, and we're going to put an eighth of a teaspoon in each one. We're measuring it into each jar so we know for certain that it has it in there. If we were to put it in our brine and then maybe not use all of it, you don't know exactly how much ends up in there. Very smart. So now it's time to fill them, and I was hoping you would help me with it. All Got right. Got the pickles here. Um, you can use this funnel or do it without. I'll do it without. I'll do the okay. harder one. You do this funnel, and we're just going to pack all these vegetables in. You don't have to do too firmly, all right. but you want it to be nice and full. And we're using these amazing tools. We're going to use our at hands. the end of our arms. Exactly. Yep. Perfect. Yeah, at this point, we don't have to worry about. Well, I mean, I don't know what's been on your hands, but we don't have to worry about it too much because we are going to go through the, the processing time. We are using very clean hands, though. We are. Clean, clean hands, America. Yes. Well, I like this funnel. All right, so we want to make sure we got a pretty even amount in all of them there. So now it's time to add our brine to it. So I'm going to just bring this back to a boil real briefly. Oh, that smells so good. It smells good, right? It smells like pickles. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and this funnel also comes in a lot of handy when you're adding that brine in. So, I'm just going to ladle this over the top. What we're doing here is called a raw pack, where we have the vegetables that are raw and we're adding hot brine on top. A hot pack is when everything is heated together. So we're going to leave a half inch headspace in each one. If you have too much air in there, you don't get a good proper seal. And now, what we're going to do is actually run the skewer around in here to dislodge air bubbles. So this is all about headspace. If we don't dislodge it now, we think we have a certain level, but then as it heats up, those bubbles rise to the surface and it totally changes. Okay. So there's a lot of air bubbles. So this one is a little low now that we've gotten that air out of there, so I'm going to add it up just to that first ridge on the jar. That's a great indicator of about a half inch. Now these are nice and warm, they're packed. We're gonna wipe the rims nice and clean. The next thing are the lids. Now you wanna use new lids every single time. You can reuse the rings, they're fine, but we really count on this seal to hold. So you need to use fresh ones every time. And that goes right on top, and then the rings go on. This is where it's really important to pay attention to how much force you're using to twist it on. We call it fingertip tight. Okay. It's really important that you allow enough space, just enough space that air can escape during the canning process. And that is actually what lowers the pressure inside here so that you form a vacuum and it pops in once you're done with it, once you take it out of the hot water. So we're gonna go on, just fingertip tight, just like that. Before we put them in the canner, we wanna make sure the water is still nice and warm between 120 and 140 degrees. So I'm gonna use my trusty jar lifter again and we'll add them right back to the pot. It's important to have about an inch of water on top of these. We're gonna bring this up to 185 degrees and we're gonna process it for 30 minutes at that temperature. That's the whole thing? That's the whole thing. All right, sounds easy. Yep. Well, how do we can cucumbers without making them mushy? 
The cells inside a cucumber contain pectin, which is what gives the pickle structure and keeps it firm and crispy. Now, pectin breaks down above 185 degrees, so the traditional canning method makes for mushy pickles. Instead, a low temp hot water bath of a temperature between 180 to 185 degrees is perfect. Bridget, look what we made. I love these, they're so <laughs> beautiful. And two days? That's it. That's all it took. Two days, folks, make your own pickles. So these have cooled for 24 hours. The last step before we actually eat them is to check the seal. So they're always gonna look good when you have the ring on. You gotta get rid of the ring and you wanna feel around and make sure that it's very tight. We really want this to be indented here. That means that we formed a successful vacuum, it pulled it in, and it formed a really good seal with this rubber gasket. So this is nice and tight, we're good to go. Now I'm just gonna use my fingers here to pop it open. Oh, it's a good sound. It is a good sound, you definitely wanna hear that. And I'll serve you some pickles. Make sure you get some red pepper here as well. That was crunchy, huh? And that brine, it's not too sweet. It's not too sweet. That's the biggest thing. It stands out right away because you're so used to bread and butter pickles being syrupy, candy-like. The only thing that would make these better is a giant, giant sandwich of pulled pork. I knew you were going to say that. <laughs> I knew I was going to let you down. Made the pickles forgot the meat and bread underneath it. This almost makes me forget that pork. Okay. How's that? Is that All right, good that's enough? that's good. Yeah, yeah, that's fine. Redemption. So the next time you pick a peck of pickled peppers, can them yourself. Start your bread and butter pickles by tossing sliced Kirby cukes with onions, peppers, and salt to draw out excess water. The secret to keeping them crisp is a product called Pickle Crisp. Then pour a tart sweet but not too sweet brine over the vegetables, process the jars, and cool. 24 hours later, it's pickle time. So from our test kitchen to your kitchen, a quick and easy recipe for the best bread and butter pickles. You can get this recipe and all the recipes from this season, along with our tastings and testings and selected episodes on our website, americastestkitchen.com. Thanks for watching America's Test Kitchen. What'd you think? Well, leave a comment and let us know which recipes you're excited to make, or you can just say hello. You can find links to today's recipes and reviews in the video description. And don't forget to subscribe to our channel. See you later. I'll see you later.